Hi, this is Possibilities. Uh, I'm Cecil Walker. And I'm Adam Froer. And um, today we wanted to talk our way through um, smallness, this idea of, of humility and, and a smallness of self and the implications of that, you know, what you can do with that, how that can help you to um, navigate potentially tricky situations and come at it in a, a more effective way. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a good place to start is to really define what is this smallness thing. And um, I mean, I, I'd love to get your thoughts on it, but the, the best that I can um, depict it um, is that it, it's uh, knowing uh, your own size, I guess, in comparison to uh, the existence of other valuable things, other people, other understandings. Um, I think it could even translate to other cultures. Um, I read an article that uh, that depicted this by uh, you know using um, the scenario where you um, are in awe of how large you know like a landscape could be. You're on the edge of a cliff, and you just see how um, amazing and, and large um, that all this you know in front of you um, looks. In comparison to uh, yourself and then even to your life your worries all those kinds of things you know how small that could feel in comparison to look how large and grand this is and how much other life there is you know uh, happening out in the landscape um, how would you modify smallness how, how would you yeah no i think you i think you said it just right i think one of the things I, as you were describing it one of the images that came to my mind recently that i saw was um the Hubble telescope mm -hmm. fixed on, you know, this tiny little space in the sky that looked completely black and for four months kind of just honed in on that and then kind of took in light as it as it came across that four, four months. And then over that time, they pieced together what was actually there, what we couldn't even see with our naked eye. Right. And what they found was 10,000 galaxies. Right. And you think about like me as an individual person mm -hmm. seeing all of a sudden seems insignificant mm -hmm. when you think in a quarter of an inch there are 10,000 galaxies right and i think on the one hand there's a there's a risk of saying so if i am small if i um if i do seem insignificant perhaps then maybe i shouldn't feel confident maybe i shouldn't feel like i have self worth maybe i shouldn't feel like i have self esteem and I want to be really clear, that's not what we're talking about here. We're not saying that your smallness and insignificant and therefore meaningless. What we are saying is that when you can appreciate kind of your situation, your place in totality, that it helps then to kind of open your mind to say, maybe my thoughts or my opinions or my experience isn't the only experience. It's not the only um it's not the only way to live life. It's not the only way of being. Right. And so I think it it helps to um, think, in essence, bring about some humility to say, I could learn something from experiencing difference. I could I could be I could be benefited by talking with, by interacting with a culture that's totally different than my own. Right. Exactly. The the thing that someone might think next is, okay, you know that sounds nice, that humility, that acknowledgement sounds nice, but what does that afford me? Um, and the thing that comes to mind first is it opens the door, to, to me at least, um, to be uh, um, in awe of the value that could come from other perspectives, the value that could have been invisible to you if you didn't have enough of that smallness, enough of that humility. Um, what else do you see as, as this affording you? Yeah, I mean, you just used a word that I actually love, the word awe, right? And mm -hmm. one of the things that I actually spent some time doing is looking at the synonyms of awe. Mm -hmm. And I think that they really do apply in this situation because sometimes awe means surprise, right? Like I, I'm surprised, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. But at other times it means like complete wonder, right? You talked before about like looking out over the, a vast landscape and and it's just like taking in the grandeur of it all, like just being in wonderment of it. But I think other times it it can awe can mean um, respect, mm -hmm. right? I am 
in awe of you. I respect you. I appreciate who you are, what you bring. And I think, so I think at different times, that smallness, that awe, um, it helps it helps us to encounter things and with true appreciation. Mm -hmm. I think another thing that it, it can reveal is, um, like you were saying, it, it's not that it means you have no value or you're inconsequential. I think it actually can show you the opposite, that you have a particular place, you know, that you belong to this larger thing. Yeah. Um, whatever perspective it is that you have, whatever role you play, whatever slice of the largeness that you have, um, you know, you have your own place in that larger thing. Yeah, and I think that's really, really valuable too, because it's not like we're saying you defer completely to right. someone else or someone else's belief system or someone else's right. culture. But in essence, you appreciate that for what it is. And in some sense, you let them appreciate what you bring um, equally, right? So I think that that smallness doesn't mean you hide what you have, mm -hmm. but it's that you feel free to share it You and, and you appreciate when other people share with you. So I think in some sense, that smallness probably increases like a reciprocity of, of giving and sharing. Yeah. yeah. I could see how without that smallness, there is a huge risk of bulldozing over the value mm -hmm. that comes from other places, of being very blind to potentially really meaningful things, um, even things that you don't know yet that you could you value yourself maybe even. Um, and certainly you are shutting out that awe, that, that potential for the awe that, that you were just describing before too. Yeah, it's interesting because as you were talking, one of the things that kind of came back to my mind is that for two years, I worked with people who were deaf, right? And I lived in England. So I worked with, I had to learn British sign language and, and work with them. And there was a whole concept that they would call deaf culture mm. that I was completely unfamiliar with. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that it existed, right? And their, their sense of humor was different, right? They would tell jokes. And at first they just flew right past mm -hmm. me because in every joke, something or someone was deaf. Mm -hmm. And it, and so the pun was always that a hearing person or a hearing entity would try to do something and would fail. Mm -hmm. And then the deaf person had to step in. And one of the one of the examples of that is like there were lumberjacks and they're cutting down trees and then they would yell timber and the tree would fall over. And then one time they yelled and the tree didn't fall over. And then a deaf person comes and signs or spells timber and the tree falls over, right? And so it's like, so from their sense of humor, but also just from the way that they interact with each other, the meaning that they have. Um, one of the things that, that I learned that I didn't ever really know was um, they would still have dances. And I'm thinking, they can't hear music. What are they dancing to? Like, how does this even work? And they would turn the music all the way up as loud as can be and then lay the speakers down on the ground so that the vibrations would go through the floor so then they could feel wherever they were in the room the feeling of the music and then they would dance to the vibrations that they could feel um and i think that it's in those experiences where i all of a sudden i did i felt small right i felt like my understanding was minuscule and i looked around and I, everybody knew what to do and what to how to act and the way to behave. Um, and all of a sudden I felt smaller. And I think in those moments we can, we can either appreciate that smallness and use it as a learning experience and kind of grasp whatever we can grasp from the situation, or we can become self-conscious. We can, we can feel insignificant. We could feel dismissed, we, you know, feel ignored or overlooked. And I think really what, what makes the difference to this idea of smallness is how we encounter it, how, how we behave when, when we realize, wait a second, I, in this situation, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the small one. Yeah, yeah that, that gets us into um, what is truly valuable about smallness um, is, is the difference it makes in our uh, interactions with things outside of ourselves. Um, probably most prominently other people outside of ourselves. Um, it, I, I think this smallness, and, and there's research that backs this up too, that, that it promotes this uh, pro-social uh, behavior. It promotes mm -hmm. uh, these things inside of us that allow us 
to uh, have more beneficial and enjoyable interactions with other people. Obviously, that's really relevant to us as uh, psychotherapists. Right. Um, I would also find it really relevant just as a person who exists in this very social world, too. Um, mm -hmm. How do you see... What's the, the problem that this solves for people? You know, if this has this value of, um, you know, kind of applying some type of social lubrication or making social interactions more enjoyable and meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, what do people do with that? What problems does that solve? Um, I think it can solve several problems. I think one, um, misunderstandings, mm -hmm. right? I think it's when you go into a, into a situation and you're determined that you're right and that somebody else is wrong, that leads to arguments, that leads to disagreements, that leads to frustration, right? And if we go in with this sense of humility, this sense of smallness, this sense of needing to learn, right? It changes, it can change many of those interactions. I think the other thing that it can solve is this, the, the sense of, um, I don't know if this is the right word, but like grandiosity, right? Of like, we see so many people today, politicians, um, actors, movie stars, who just come across as like, I'm right, whatever I want, I should get, I'm entitled, right? Um, you see a lot of families come in to see us and there's an entitlement on behalf of like adolescents or parents who say, you should do exactly what I want you to do. Right. And I think that when we approach interactions with this sense of smallness, the sense of humility, um, then there's an appreciation for why, why are they asking me to do what they're asking me to do? Why, why are they trying to um, influence me in this way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it, it can solve a lot of um, family discord. Mm -hmm. um, I think that carries over into workplace situations. It carries over into friendships, it can, right? It carries over into being on the road with lots of other people, yeah. right? When you, when you slow down and you say, look at all of these cars that mm -hmm. are on the road, everyone's trying to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm one piece of this puzzle. Um, all of a sudden, I have an appreciation for maybe somebody's in more of a hurry than I am. Maybe somebody's in an emergency and I'm not. And it changes the way that I now interact with everyone around me. Yeah. Some of those examples that you used um, started to even uh, pull in these, these depictions of people with more power than some of the others around them. Like you said, parents and children. Uh, politicians certainly, you know, elected officials have that power. Even us in our jobs, yeah. in our roles, um, have a remarkable amount of power over the clients that we're seeing. Um, how do you see this still being useful and maybe even more effective to go out in a way of, of smallness and humility when you're in a position of power like we are? Mm. Yeah, that's such an excellent question, especially in the therapeutic realm, but I think also in other realms um, as a leader, right um to to be willing to learn from those who are under you right mm -hmm. um hopefully we're hiring people because they have skills because they have expertise because they have experience mm -hmm. and to think that i as a leader am the only one who knows what's right or who can say what needs to happen um that you really do stifle mm -hmm. the the whole creativity of a team, right? Or you you minimize the abilities yeah. that are surrounding you. And I think in a therapeutic realm, you may completely miss what is important to somebody who's sitting with you or what they value or what their belief system is because you think you know what's right. And I think many therapeutic approaches, this is one of the things I have struggled with a bit, is that many therapeutic approaches, the clinician is looked at as the expert, right? They know what's right. They know what's wrong. They tell the people what intervention to use. And I think from a solution focus perspective, it's very much about a co-construction. If I don't come into a dialogue um, with this sense of smallness, with this sense of humility, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pick up the words that you're yeah. using. I'm not going to be inquisitive about um, what you believe or how you want to live your life. Mm -hmm. Instead, I'm going to be like, you're living life wrong. You should live like this instead. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it has, I think it has major implications. Yeah. Yeah. You highlighted a couple of really big things. Um, I think one 
you miss out on how to even communicate with someone, mm -hmm. um, how to have an interaction that actually is exchanging anything you know meaningful or significant. Um, and in a ther therapeutic setting, uh, that's the whole point, right? Like that's right. why we're there in the first place. Um, but then you also this the more important thing I think that you miss out on is, um, you know, we're talking about really meaningful things. And I think this applies to other contexts too. You know, yeah. I think political action usually is about meaningful things. Right. Um, but with our clients, we're talking about really, really meaningful things. And who better to teach us what is meaningful than this person whose life it's, you know, these things are occurring. Yeah, and one of the things that I think kind of to bring us back full circle is so much of solution focused therapy is being in awe of people, right? Mm -hmm. People will come in and they'll say, I've been through horrible tragedies or I have experienced, you know, the worst deprivation or whatever. And it's easy to pity them or to um, feel like they're, you know, now ruined or that they can't overcome these things. And I think this idea of, of smallness really can shift our perspective and to think simultaneously, look at what they have been able to overcome or endure. Um, and all of a sudden that awe mm -hmm. is not just about seeing some amazing landscape, but it's about looking at somebody and saying, I can't imagine experiencing what you've experienced and being able to sit here as a person and talk about it or even have hope that you could have a different experience or have the determination to keep trying even though you've been knocked over time and time again. And so I think that's really one of the major implications I think for solution focused therapy is when, when I recognize how much people have endured, I can be so amazed by them and I should shrink in a yeah. moment like that. And I should say, teach me how you've done these amazing things despite this incredible difficulty. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've seen firsthand how uh, much of a difference that can be, that can make, especially for people who aren't used to, you know, having an audience that is in awe of them mm -hmm. or feeling like they possess something valuable, they possess some perspective that could be meaningful, they possess some reason to have power trusted back into their hands. Right. Um, and I also can't help but think of how much of a difference this would make in any ordinary interaction when you are in awe of people in general. You're in awe of people who are different than you. You're in awe of people who are strangers to you. You're in awe of uh, coworkers, people you overlook, you know, wherever you go. Right. Um, I, I feel like you cannot interact the same way with the cashier at the grocery store if you just kind of carry this sense of smallness that allows you to be in awe of every human being that you come in contact with. Yeah, yeah. So I think the, the way that I would wrap up is um, in some sense, when we, when we live our lives with a sense of smallness, with a sense of humility, um, we, don't, we don't minimize our own greatness, but we recognize that we're one piece of greatness that fits into something even greater. Yeah. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.